Hey friends, Irene Lyon here and welcome to this world of nervous system health and healing. And today I have an interview that definitely gets into nervous system health and healing from a birthing perspective, from the point of view of what it takes to create, raise and birth trauma-free, healthy humans. And Eric and I connected back in 2019, late 2019. She attended one of the workshops I was teaching and she got hooked and she went on to do Smart Body, Smart Mind and just really immerse herself into relearning how to be in her body from this nervous system and really neurobiological perspective. She is a medical doctor and a surgeon by trade. So she is someone who understands this body in, in incredible depth and I think our conversation shows what it might look like to have this perfect balance with Western medicine and um, our scientific intuition that we all have. Um, and sometimes we have to cultivate after living a life of conditioning and not being connected to the body and to the, the earth around us. Um, it was a true joy to, to reconnect with her and hear her stories, um, two very different stories with the birth of her first daughter about seven-ish years ago to the birth of her second daughter just in uh, mid-2022. So this one is for not just um, the moms and the future moms and the dads, but to all those who work with women in this birthing process, doctors, to show you that there is a way of doing this naturally the way we maybe used to back in the day. It's possible and it just is such a joy to see this happen in, in real time. And um, I can't wait for you to listen and hear our conversation. Of course, any links to her and her offerings um, are in the show notes below here. Enjoy. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thanks for it's having a, me, Irene. Oh, yes. Um, we have been wanting to talk for a little bit. We met in 2019 at an up and down workshop in Santa Cruz-ish area, California. And I want to talk a little bit about that, that experience. Um, I actually remember, these are the things I remember. I remember we started the first um, session with Elia and it was the washing the hands. And of course I'm in a sea of people I've never met. And I remember you were just, I think to my left and you just started crying. Do you remember that? Yeah, um, it was bowling. We was were doing the, the bowl bowling, okay. the, the litmus testing. So moving, mm -hmm. and it, it was like one of the first things that we had done. But your language was, you know, you're going to experience growing capacity for what's possible, mm -hmm. and the possibility of just the left and the right. Um, movement and then the mm. fact that like the next time I did it, it it was like it had opened up a whole new door of possibility right. but I felt this like um I'm not usually like a sad emotional crier I'm hmm. more of like a um like a move to beauty kind of right. emoter and I mean I just I felt so moved by the fact that I had just like unlocked you know again that capacity concept of mm -hmm. like what's possible Mm -hmm. it, was, it was so cool. The hand washing, you know, as a surgeon, I yeah. wash my hands a lot. But I did get a lot out of the hand washing as well because I kind of yeah. rushed through those things. And then with the up down, it was like creating such awareness and careful attention to the most mm -hmm. mundane things. And that's actually mm -hmm. been a really big spiritual practice for me since your workshop. So thank you. You're welcome. And as a contextual element, you are a surgeon. Yes. And in some of the notes you sent me before we chatted, you had mentioned, um, if I can recall, that you had had a bit of a trauma with, I don't know if it was a patient or something that occurred right before. Um, so my sense is your system was also maybe really ripe for getting some stuff out. What, what was going on? And maybe just let folks know what you do as, as your day job, and then we'll get into the medicalization of birth and the birth process that you want to share, but what do you do? What's your day job? Yeah, um, my day job is I'm a general and bariatric surgeon and um, yeah, taking care of a lot of people. And 
And mm-hmm. I have one of those very open, empathic kind of hearts. And I've also been conditioned to want to please and people please. Mm-hmm. And the circumstance that you're describing, which led to me finding you on your up down workshop, yeah. was you know, a very kind of common general surgery complication, but in a very complicated uh, patient. Mm. And um, ultimately, you know, the frustration of the patient not having the outcome that they wanted Mm -hmm. um, was, it really pulled at my heartstrings. But then there were some behavioral aspects where, Um, you know, this patient kind of refused to leave the hospital, had a lot of fear about going home. I was being, um, more or less verbally assaulted by them on a daily basis. I had to have chaperones. I had to have Mm -hmm. my entire risk management team, patient care team. Um, and so that kind of violation of the nervous system and not really being in control of your environment. I mean, I, I was in survival stress to where... I was having like nightmares <laughs> at night. It was really um, interesting and disturbing. And it felt very, um, it was just, it was the most unusual um, doctor patient interaction I've, yeah. I've ever had. And there, really, there's nothing in my training that ever prepared me for, for what I experienced. Um, and so it wasn't a physical attack, it was verbal, verbal, emotional. Yep. Um, you know, really being blamed for every shortcoming, um, of this, you know, person's experience. And, and again, as the surgeon, as the healer, as the person who can usually come in and, you know, there's instant gratification in what I do. And then, you know, yes, outcomes happen, but when you have an outcome in certain people and it's explained and, you know, there's a lot of good rapport, there's usually heartfelt sense that, sometimes these things are kind of just out of our control or there's a lot of what we call patient factors. Um, and you know, yeah, you, you come in skilled, you, 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 um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a humble person. Um, and I just took so much of it to heart and then to Mm be really verbally assaulted and it um, hurts. Oh, it hurts so bad. It hurts on so many levels. Yeah. I think this is important because a lot of times um, people will say, oh, Irene, but I had no trauma. You know, I wasn't beaten and attacked or there was plenty of food on the table. All those things that we tend to associate with a traumatic, say, childhood or situation. And now I think maybe 10 years ago we didn't realize this, but now it's pretty common knowledge that verbal, emotional abuse attack is just as, if not sometimes, harder because there's no physical signs or symptoms so well yeah you mentioned this you know how how do you protect yourself Mm -hmm. you know so like there's an element of like yeah i can do the nervous system work to feel better and to help Mm -hmm. me process but like in the moment yeah how do you really protect yourself there there's not a lot of um you know defense classes for emotional and verbal (laughs) abuse and so you know I've had to kind of like reflect on that too you know and like body language or some of the things that I kind of like have been processing after that is just like Mm -hmm. you know I do have authority to tell somebody that how they're talking to me is inappropriate you do. But I didn't have those tools at the time. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Mm. Hmm. Since there's a workshop in your future around uh, that for your physician colleagues. I, I, I yes. I, I'm learning lots all the time. Yeah. And out of, out of an interest for me, um, what led you to want to become a surgeon? Was that something you knew immediately when you went into medical school? Kind of. Um, yeah. I have a very open mind, holistic, um, perspective. Um, I knew I wanted to go into medicine for an opportunity to travel and, you know, really educate myself in a way that would be different than what I was kind of brought up in Mm -hmm. and really felt inspired to help people. Um, you know, what if the apocalypse happens, what kind of skills are you going to need to fall back on? 
and showing up in a community, especially community that needed to start from scratch. I don't, I don't know why I've always been drawn to that. Like I've never been afraid of apocalypse. I've actually, like I love survival. Interesting. Um, I think it's, I think it's fascinating and I think it's really good skills. Um, so surgery uh, or just medicine in general kind of matched that. And then yeah. I went to osteopathic medical school, which is traditionally mm. very mind body and very yes. open. And, and I, I loved all of that. So like the nervous system stuff that you do, the vagus nerve, like I know every single tissue and <gasps> embryologic origin that the vagus nerve possesses and viscerosomatic reflexes and all these things. Um, and then surgery, it, it is this kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm getting this level of training, like go big or go home. Like mm. how I, if somebody is in a car crash, how do you stop the bleed? How do you take yeah. out somebody's spleen? How do you, how do you save a life? Yeah. And so um, I'm just really grateful for this skill set. And then because of my nutrition background, mm -hmm. obesity surgery and bariatrics mm -hmm. really is the blend. I feel mm -hmm. like it's kind of like the unifier of what is Western medicine and how good is Western medicine? What is it good at? Yeah. And then also the preventative aspect. So I get to talk to all my patients about nutrition. We get to take them off medications. We get mm. them moving their bodies, trauma, talk, language, emotional processing, you know, food behaviors, addiction, like all of these things are kind of woven in. And so it's not like I specifically carry all those hats, but I'm the support system yeah the surgeon that believes in all of those things. And then I network with my dietitians, with my psychologists and like, just, I just work with a wonderful team. That's amazing. Um, out of, uh, just interest, what is the definition of bariatric bariatrics? Because yeah. I, I think, um, I mentioned, I was talking to you to even, I think it was my husband or someone. And I said, Oh, she's a bariatric surgeon there. What's that? And all I could say was it has to do with the stomach. So can you explore that yeah. topic, that kind of medicine for yeah, us? Yeah, so you're exactly right. Bariatric does mean stomach um, in technically is stomach surgery. Mm -hmm. um, but it's morphed now into a more complex physiology understanding that there's certain stomach surgeries that we do that change the hormonal physiology that regulates appetite and insulin regulation. So wow. it's really, really, really nerdy. And that is I mean, nerdy. not, not, not every bariatric surgeons really nerdy into the physiology. Um, but I love it. I love gut physiology. I love what the body is capable of. And, um, essentially gastric bypasses, I'm reversing type two diabetes. Um, which is, you know, pretty wow. cool. And, yeah. you know, I, there's some, um, concerns out in the community well surgery is really invasive and it's like yeah it is really invasive and it's also a really powerful tool and we have it so mm -hmm. drilled down so methodically set up to where our outcomes we actually now have you know modern day surgery and i do robotic surgery too which is another fun mm. exponential wave of just how much i am um, really grateful for my training and um, the opportunity i have to help people but, um, yeah, we're, you know, our outcomes are better than almost any elective general surgery out there. Um, hmm. people, we do it minimally invasive through tiny, tiny little incisions. Yeah. And most of my patients are going home the same day as these, you know, rather complex gastrointestinal surgeries. So interesting. I am someone, I like what you said about the blend of me Western medicine with emotional, I don't even know what we call it these days. It seems like alternative isn't the right topic because mm -hmm. it is an alternative. It's just another element. Mm -hmm. But recently I was teaching um, some new students, Erica, uh, your smart body, smart mind peers mm -hmm. actually in a higher level group. And I really wanted to say like, we need to respect all forms of healthcare because what sometimes happens, and I've seen this in some of my mind-body colleagueal spaces, is there'll be bad talking about you know the the Western medicine and how it it's just so evil, and it's like okay, well there's also some pretty bad stuff that happens in culty mind-body practices, so it goes both ways. And I just reminded everyone, you know, sometimes your future client or patient or student might need to see a doctor. 
and there's no damn shame in that. It's okay. Um, and then sometimes that doctor, yeah, it might do things worse by giving them a medication when they could have done a mind body exercise. So it's about seeing the whole picture. I think that's why we connected and I was like, we need to talk because you do understand those multiple levels and what you said about the apocalypse is just brilliant because <laughs> I am looking for a surgeon in Canada for that potential reason of, okay, if we need someone to go in and do a little yeah. heavy lifting internally, who would I call up? And you're a little too far to just truck over with your horse and buggy. Um, but well, Vancouver Island is the uh, meetup spot for when the apocalypse does happen for me and my <laughs> other surgeon <laughs> friends. So we're going to build a commune out there. Just, Don't just tell saying. Anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Whoops. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you can come to the mainland. There you go. There <laughs> Not you a go. place you can stay. But I love it. And um, I know we're, we're kind of going on funny uh, sideway topics here. But I have to ask, did you ever watch the show um, Station Eleven? I read the book. <gasps> mm -hmm. You're one of the first persons. I did not read the book. I watched mm -hmm. the series that just came out. And I'm remembering a part where um they they in the, the the show they ended up in what was like a walmart or a furniture store for those that don't know um it, it is an apocalyptic series but it's not depressing because it's about what people do afterwards and how they come together and create art and music but also how um there is another side we could say the dark side that tried to keep um the authorities of how humanity was before because that was comfortable but there was this one um scene this will go beautifully into childbirth where these women were there to birth babies and there was a physician there that knew how to do this and she was like one of the only doctors that was around and just all these women were birthing babies in like this walmart uh, thing that they had converted into a hospital and I just when you said that I just had this vision of oh yeah I could see Erica in there delivering delivering babies and teaching these mothers how to feel sensation and all those things so. absolutely I mean and again like with my general <laughs> surgery background there's literally like nothing I can't really do exactly um you know granted sure it's not modern standard of care but yeah and that just that just I find so much security in that yeah could you do brain surgery if you had to? If I had to stop a brain bleed, yes. I know how to do a crany. I know how to, you know, clear clots. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's not something I do, but I mean, I've seen enough of it and I know yeah. how to use the tools and then I know how to care for people. So, yeah, it, um, <laughs> amen, sister. Beautiful. I got you. I'll, 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 I'll do all the heavy lifting and that happens. <laughs> awesome. I love it. I grew up seeing surgery too. My father was a veterinarian. Yeah. Um, and I literally have memories of eating my sandwiches, like in the OR, smelling the smells of the anesthesia and the, that sterile smell when you incise. And, and um, yeah. I probably shouldn't have been in there, but I was because that's where I hung out as a little kid. And yeah, it's just, it is a fascinating art surgery. So mm -hmm. thank you for that art form. <laughs> Let's talk about your babies. Mm -hmm. and your kiddos so mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna read what you wrote me um it would have been uh, I don't know four or five months ago I'm really close to when your second one was born I when believe. I was in my euphoric bliss state yes yeah so this uh with permission I am reading this uh you sent this to me via Instagram Irene exclamation mark I want to thank you all caps I've recently had a pain-free physiologic free birth and I attribute my experience to all the nervous system and trauma work I've done with you polyvagal theory smart body smart mind and now smart physiologic delivery I'd love to connect some time over microbiome and the ANS autonomic nervous system my birth story and trauma healing your work somatic experiencing and healing the old hidden kind of occult trauma in the body I love how you worded that Mine stemmed from frustration buried in the left psoas, for those that don't know, that's the hip flexor, a muscle, and hip flexor, and as a form of a defense, an early childhood coping mechanism. 
connecting and releasing all the fears, old patterns, and stepping into presence with the up and down workshop um, that you came to um, live and in person freed me. And I just had the most perfect unassisted free birth. If this story interests you, let's connect. That made me so happy. <laughs> um, as someone who hasn't had her own biological children, I don't think it's off the books, even though I'm older, I'm starting to learn that there are women that give birth very, very late in life. Um, so that's not off the table for me, but I haven't yet, but I have many friends, of course, girlfriends who have, and some of the stories are horrendous. I'm starting to hear though more stories that are not horrendous. So how would you like to share this story? What is your gut hit? Is it to talk about the first birth of your daughter when it was not this easy or the one that just occurred? Or how would you like to begin telling this tale? Yeah, I mean, as you were saying, like, you know, you've heard it being horrendous. Um, and then you also just shared that, you know, you want, you're like, you're potentially going to be an older woman having birth. A, I find, uh, <laughs> comparatively, there's six years difference between my first and my second. Yeah. And being 36, just in these last six years, I have so much more experiential wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I got goosebumps thinking about, you know, even just like this notion of being an older mom, mm -hmm. that should excite you because you have so much more wisdom and so much more experience. Like yeah. you're going to be potentially a lot, um, without saying better or worse, but I think that there's, there's more potency there to motherhood oh, for sure. with that. And at least for that, sure. that's what my experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so many things. Things I don't know <laughs> where to start because even just when you reread that message, mm. I'm like, oh yeah, like the beginning of kind of the unfolding from the somatic experience started for me even before I got pregnant, but it kind yeah. of like coincided with me getting pregnant. Yeah. So this left hip flexor, I'd be like driving my car, sitting in my desk, and and even right now I'm still aware of it. Sure. Um, and it's not pain. <laughs> That's the best yeah. part. It's not pain, but there's energy there. There's yeah. a warmth. There's a presence. There's a uh, asymmetry. Yep. And so I uh, sought out a woman that I made a connection with in town who does like private individualized uh, yoga classes in a mm -hmm. little studio in her backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, this will be a really um, fun way for me to get to know this left-sided body energy. Yeah. And so we had these little practices that we would do. And simultaneously, I was like, I'm going to start getting massage regularly. Mm. You know, like, I think that would be really nice. So I have this wonderful massage therapist who would, I mean, holy cow, like once a month, um, really start focusing on this left side. Yeah. And the psoas was so incredibly painful she would massage me on my side. She would get it from the front, from the yeah. back. And I mean, it was like on fire when she touched it the way that she could. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of flexibility and whatever, but it still wasn't really fully releasing. Yeah. I have another woman, Corvallis is just a really special place. Yeah. Um, another woman I became a friends with who does um, belief, emotion, loop kind of coaching sure and she's also a somatics practitioner and so I got pregnant in the middle of my massage and my yoga practice mm. and I had intentionally said after my first daughter was born oh we'll have another one when she's about six well I ended up getting pregnant on the exact same moon cycle Oh wow! almost you know five years after my daughter was born to where their birthdays are only 10 days apart Wow! and um you know so was it a surprise i was surprised i was pregnant i wasn't mm -hmm. exactly formally trying mm -hmm. um but again energetically our hearts kind of knew and we were already open and so with yeah. that i feel intentional about it so then i get I get pregnant and um still getting massage, still doing a little bit of yoga, kind of modifying that, you know, and, and I mean, I'm just feeling grateful that I'm connecting to this part yeah. of my body. I'm not really yeah. trying to fix it. I'm not trying to push it. Again, I'm not experiencing pain. I'm just mm -hmm. aware. Mm -hmm. 
And then I start really reflecting on my childbirth with my first. Right. And I remember the couple of things happened. Number one, my baby brother died that same year when I was pregnant with my first daughter. Mm. And my parents, bless their hearts, were grieving. Of course. Exceptionally, painfully difficult, you know, all those things. And so I live kind of far away from them, and I invited them out to be present for the birth of my daughter. Your first daughter. My first daughter. Yeah. And I really wanted them to be there. I wanted to give them to that. You know, I just, I, yeah, I just, for all the empathic grieving things. Well, they were living in my space, patiently waiting. And um, simultaneously, news came up that my stepfather who is in this scenario with me Mm -hmm. had another daughter that he didn't tell us about Mm. and out of the grief in which my parents were experiencing my mother shared that with me in that moment and um this gets into yeah dad stuff and parent stuff and you know ancestral trauma and the lineages and you know holy shit all that stuff Mm -hmm. um at first my heart was like wonderful another human for you guys to love right like that's the logic heart space and then the longer it kind of sat in and processed the angrier and more frustrated I got because my stepfather who raised me and was a wonderful father to me more or less abandoned his daughter the way that my biological father had done Mm. to me and then also he wasn't really in a position where he could openly talk to me about it so we never got resolution we never got any of those things um being an osteopath i'm very well connected with the osteopathic manipulative therapy community and a friend of mine another friend was um i had my whole left side of my body seized up i was Mm. having excruciating pain and I called him up and I was like, I need emergency OMT in my house. <laughs> and yeah, so he comes yeah. over and he's treating me and he's just like, your liver's on fire. Yeah. You are like, what's going on? And I shared with him a little bit and he's like, whoa. And then he commented on the left side being really tense and tight. So my parents end up leaving because they had other things and were already almost 10 days overdue. They couldn't, right. they couldn't hang out for three weeks waiting for my daughter to be born. Right. Two days after they leave, I spontaneously go into labor. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, well, that, that's, that giggle, that's the reflection, right? It's like, I didn't feel safe. Yeah. And I felt angry and I felt frustrated. And like, it was just the wrong emotional time to yeah. go through all of that and then talk about, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. like even with that patient experience, I didn't have the language. I didn't have the skills to then like really confront this because mm-hmm. confrontation, I'm growing into this is a good thing. Yeah. And I just, you know, kind of kept it to myself. And mm-hmm. so, you know, labor's going and, and labor's fine. And it's, it's, you know, but it, and I wanted it to happen so bad that right. I was just like, I'm in labor, I'm in labor. And I just like all this tenseness yeah, and all this excitement. And then all this, like, you know, also background frustration and not feeling safe and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, um, the labor with my first daughter was kind of fast, furious, hard, tense yeah. it's like the uterus was like spasming on top yeah. of a cervix that didn't want to open, open. and yeah. I didn't know how to open it and then I threw up the entire time so my midwives vomiting. were lovely oh yeah vomited yeah, the just, whole okay ugh, 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 like I could <laughs> not stop vomiting and then um she had meconium what is that I so, read that yeah, it's when the baby um, like has their first stool in utero, uh, and so it taints the you know, and 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 it's not that scary of a thing, mm-hmm. but um, I was trying to do an out of hospital birth in a birthing center, and then here's just where my medical brain is. I was one of the first, and then also knowing that I was in the medical community, and these people were in the medical community, I was thinking about them and like what would happen if my baby needed resuscitation and I didn't make the choice to go to the hospital. Right. Like I, I, 
I remember, I remember thinking like, I couldn't do this to you. <laughs> yeah. And so we drive to the hospital and then I get an epidural cause I was like throwing up like crazy. And I did end up having a beautiful, uncomplicated vaginal delivery. But again, that reflection, because I did all your nervous system work, learned about polyvag. I've been learning about all this stuff since 2016 when my first, you know, after yeah, that, yeah. after that. Yeah. And so I'm just connecting all the dots and I'm experiencing all these things in my body. And so I went to my girlfriend that does the coaching, the belief, thought loop kind of yeah. stuff. And I was like, if anybody can help me uncover like this energetic connection to this left psoas and these things I'm like it's going to be you and so we opened it up with a session and um, again taking all of these things together she took me on a journey to my childhood and mm. we did like an EMDR thing mm -hmm. and the version of myself that I saw was like my seven eight year old self in the heat of frustration not even with a father figure but with a grandmother figure mm -hmm. over over just not being understood and feeling controlled and i was so angry and so defensive that like i could feel my whole body recoiling like i was yeah. getting ready to push punch or kick with my yeah. right body so yeah. my left body is like firmly on the ground mm -hmm. and my whole body's wrapping around it <laughs> and and I'm like oh like that's the contraction mm -hmm. and then like the ease comes mm -hmm. into like the not being defensive feeling seen feeling heard being able to express myself in a really meaningful and impactful way and um you know so the experience was, you know, that image of the little girl self and then the image of this more enlightened, adult, kind, you know, perfect version of myself. Mm -hmm. And we swap, oh, we swap the okay. two. Swap, right. swap, 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 swap. Yeah. To where when we stop, the little girl turned around and had a conversation with my grown up. I mean, it was just, it was really, really, really neat. And I'd never had that experience. I've never done anything like that before. Yeah. But I, I did that coming from a very, again, wholesome perspective of like, I just want to know what this is. Mm -hmm. And then when I learned what that was, I felt like, okay, now, now the practice is learning how to have such internal alignment mm -hmm. to my sense of self that I can express myself without feeling like I always have to people please or worry what the other person is thinking or doing. Yeah. And so um, my husband kind of joked around with me because as I was getting further and further along in the pregnancy, he's like, you're definitely a little more prickly. <laughs> You're, and just to be clear, your second pregnancy. My second pregnancy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now so we're six I, years later. Yep. Yeah, now we're six years later. Yeah. I'm doing all this work. Yeah. And, you know, again, just having more alignment to like not people pleasing. Mm -hmm. And it's like I can care what others think and I can care what, what what the outcome is. But I also need to like express myself and make sure that I am actually, you know, either doing or compromising based off of what my real needs are. Completely. I'm reminding myself right now of a say of something that Gabor Mate said once. I'm sure you know of his work. Um, do you know who Gabor Mate is? He's a Vancouver physician. No. Oh, wow. You haven't come across. Oh, well, there's your next reading uh, um, stint. Um, he, he is no longer a practicing physician, um, but he, he has a long story. He's older. Really saw when he was the head of palliative care at Vancouver General. Um, this would have been like in the 80s that a lot of the folk, and often young, who were dying, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, like intense autoimmune, MS, ALS, all those really nasty degenerative diseases, had a very similar trait of um, doing for everyone else but not themselves. And he even said to their day on their deathbed, they were apologizing for having to put out their family for having to be there taking time out of their day. And um, so his book, When the Body Says No, is brilliant. I still think it's probably one of his best books. He's written about five. 
but he said in a, a talk I was listening to where he's talking to a sea of, you know, couples and people, um, that and he was talking to the husbands and he said to the husbands, so the more your wife is a bitch, <laughs> the healthier she's going to be. She won't get cancer. And, and I just, I, I'm, and everyone, you know, breaks out in laughter, but he's true. And so when you were saying you were just being a bit more prickly, it, it's like, yeah, <laughs> so good. And, Cause that is connected. That niceness, that people pleasing, um, has just been infused into our society and conditioning. And I am starting to see it shift. Um, not everywhere, but in, in little doses and there's hope because of that. And so his research really delineates, he brings in the research. So if you want to cheat, go to his books cause he's done it all. And he's found the research to back that up. I, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. I, I recently, um, came across a podcast that, uh, Guru Jagat had kind of put out mm -hmm. and the topic was devouring or honoring the ma. And she describes this, um, old Russian, uh, folk tale where this grandmother was really just kind of mean and gruff mm -hmm. and, you know, um, you know, kind of like a, a drill sergeant, so to speak. And like, mm -hmm. was just really kind of this, um, energy of, mm -hmm. um, like, this is what I want. This is what I am. And, you know, kids would get in trouble by grandma or whatever it was. It was just really interesting. And she describes, um, yeah, just, where, you know, women need to come into this sort of like knowing that we can be devouring, <laughs> we can be alpha mm -hmm. and, and we can, um, you know, really show up for each other and like honor that in each other. So as an exercise, she has a workshop where mm -hmm. the women don't smile at each other <laughs> because we're conditioned to kind of smile at each other, but you yes. know, in the opposite, I'm like, but polyvagal, like, of course we love smiling at each other. It makes us mm -hmm. feel good. It's co-regulation. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as a woman, we're hyper conditioned yeah. to do it because, you know, it's our job, our mothering job to make everybody else feel good. A hundred percent. Um, I was working with someone recently, a student, um, and just to make it neutral, they grew up um, always saying everything was fine. Mother died very young. Papa was like, everything is fine. We're not going to talk about the fact that your mother just died. And this you know, young woman is beautiful, and she does have a beautiful smile. And um, I did a little work with her, and she was really pissed off about something, and she was smiling. And I, and I said, hey, I want you to take your hands and just like be like, I, you know, just like go the opposite way. And I can't remember what I said because it was in the moment, but it was something like, you know, I'm not okay. I'm not happy, you know, and, and then that clicked, some emotion came out and then there was this, this dropping. And then it's like, I saw really her for the first time without the smile. And it was, it was tough. Like it was really tough because that, you know, even the lines in your face are so used to doing that. It will feel foreign to not have that smile. And you're right about the polyvagal. Um, and polyvagal isn't just about the vagus nerve. It's also about the sympathetic fight flight response. And that gets left out, right? True. It isn't True. just about ventral. It's about, yeah. you need to roar. You need to run. That's yeah. part of that ladder. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, absolutely, you know, and um, a word that I'm just really loving right now is just paradox, mm. you know, and I feel like paradox is like the Western version of like the yin yang, <laughs> yeah. yin yang concepts, you know, it's like for the equal and opposite and just like, you know, everything sort of exists with a this and, and that was part of kind of my journey, which is. So this birth, this birth. Yes, this, let's get this into new this birth. current one. Um, part of the environment sort of creation, mm -hmm. which is, um, it was, uh, July is a busy month in my family. Okay. Um, it was my husband's mom's 70th birthday. And she hadn't been to America in mm -hmm. a long time. Okay. And, you know, she lives in Australia. And so the, you know, the COVID pandemic, everything, all of our travel kind of like got postponed. Of course. So she really wanted to come over. It was her 70th birthday. 
Right. And, you know, my, you know, I, I wanted to build my, my cave to go have my baby in. Um, but, you know, part of that, it was both and. The paradox was you haven't seen your mother in a long time. She lives really far away from us. And it's her 70th birthday. Like, we're going to let her come. We're going to yeah. let her come. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, so she came, she was present. She actually watched this birth actually, oh. which is pretty magical. And my husband's mom and I, we have, um, a relationship, I, I would say much different than the one I have to my own mother, my own mother. There's like a lot of emotional attachment, mm -hmm. you know, I do want to people please my own mother, mm -hmm. but my mother-in-law, I don't actually have to people please with her. And it's, yeah. it's a wonderful it's actually a really beautiful relationship and she's one of like the first people um in terms of like yeah kind of mom energy that i've been able to like yeah you know she th there's absolute respect there right and the respect feels really good the respect trumps a lifetime of love and conditioning mm -hmm. and all these other things mm -hmm. um but with that i had to tell my own parents that i didn't want them there mm -hmm. and so um they did they 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 weren't there so that was like one thing mm -hmm. um good for you by the way thank you yeah thank you yeah we yeah. can do we, we can have hard conversations yeah um and then uh surgery life busy um working, working. i with my first baby had worked all the way up until my due date and then she was 10 days late i know yeah. silly mm -hmm. silly Silly, silly. I know, I know, but okay. Learn, uh, live and learn. Live and learn. So this time, um, I had lost a surgery partner, hired a new one. He had started uh, one week before my water spontaneously broke and pulled me out of mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. whether I wanted to or not. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the cosmic joke and the beautiful aspect of it all, which was my water broke. I could no longer work, cancel all the patients, cancel all the surgeries, new mm -hmm. surgery partner, you're going to fly. I'm off. Yeah. And um, it was absolutely uh, magical. But here came the new challenge. Mm -hmm. With your water breaking, conventional medical wisdom, which again, I'm a Western medical doctor, says if you don't go spontaneously go into labor within 24 hours, there's probably something wrong. You need to be induced. You need to be on antibiotics. And it was this whole constellation yeah. of like kind of wild care. So I had a home birth midwife mm -hmm. and she was um, also anticipatory of the upcoming labor. Mm -hmm. um, most people within 72 hours of their water break, I think it's like 80 or 90% go into labor. Mm. Well, I didn't. Right. I, I just, I'm going to be play ignorant card here. I didn't realize. I thought, you know, it's, you see it portrayed in the movies, water breaks and poof, it happens. But that isn't actually what is always supposed to occur. No. All right. I know. So you're learning things all the time. And, you know, because <laughs> we live in the era of um, instant information, mm -hmm. I sat at home and Googled and Google scholar and read all these research papers. I mean, I was, <laughs> I, I was an anxious hot mess, actually. I mean, so again, the paradox, which is, oh, I have this time, I can relax, I can do, you know, sensory exercises. Mm -hmm. I was doing yoga nidra like three times a day. Mm -hmm. I was going for walks. I mean, I was really giving myself the downtime mm -hmm. that I hadn't had. And I was just like waiting. But because of this leak, so um, there's different places and different volumes of leaking of amniotic right. fluid and water breaking that can happen. But the real risk occurs as soon as you check. Because you are in infiltrating, inserting, infiltrating a sterile area. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then from a microbiome perspective, not all amniotic fluid is even sterile at the time of birth. So right. something like a urinary tract infection, a gut mm. infection, a tooth abscess, all of these things can. So in medicine, we don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Is it infection that causes you to leak or is it the checking that then introduces the infection? Right. So um, that was interesting. And yeah. then I have a lot of friends in healthcare as well. And then they couldn't help but get worried. And so I'm just being, you know, 
bombarded by all of these hyper concerned people around me Mm. and it was a low level leak and my midwife and I kept checking in she kept doing biophysical profiles baby's heart rate was great I was feeling great Mm -hmm. and you know the common sort of awareness is your body's going to keep making fluid Mm. it does it's not Mm. like there's a finite amount because your body's also recycling it right so it's kind of like part of the aerodigestive process of newborns. Mm-hmm. So about a week in, I mean, I even had a friend come and sit down with me and, you know, like tell me that they were concerned that if I didn't do something, I was going to have a bad outcome. Right. And I get it. And also my midwife yeah. was like, you know, the further we go out, I just want to make sure that you understand the like what's on the table Mm -hmm. and so like what well what is on the table I mean I thought you were okay with it I feel okay and she's like well in the home birth midwifery practice when mothers want to make informed decisions that go against the standard of care the outcome is yours Mm -hmm. and this is a huge paradox to what we do in hospital like western medicine the decision is never the patient's. It's the doctor's. It's the doctor's. And yeah. we practice such defensive medicine. Mm-hmm. We use literature to support our decision. We document the heck out of it. We tell the patient what the best treatment is because if there's a bad outcome, it's just the nature of the the literature. You know, it kind of like deflects all of the humanness of it. Yeah. Um, so... To compromise and to make myself feel like I was still in control Mm -hmm. of my decision Um, because I was feeling a little out of body at that point, you know, I didn't want to stillbirth. I didn't want these things, you Mm -hmm. know, like, of course, of course, that's not the outcome I want. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, I do carry a personal philosophy that nobody's getting out of here alive and to fear death is not a logical Mm -hmm. uh, way that humans need to live their life. But when you're presented with an opportunity to you know save your baby or Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. save your baby it's different it's not you anymore it's this other being so I did a biophysical profile at the hospital where they ultrasounded Mm -hmm. baby was perfect Perfect. oh my gosh perfect I'm like okay (laughs) good reassurance reassurance telling everybody else I feel good what I've been doing for the last week is entirely my own experience and I'm Mm going to keep intuitively like listening and following my own impulse so that being said, almost two weeks to the exact day of my water breaking, um, <laughs> I go into labor. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just imagining every day kind of leading up to this as I'm doing like my mindfulness stuff and my meditation stuff. And by the way, I'm having my other daughter's birthday party. My parents did come visit. I had my at that time, um, at, at that time <laughs> because she came a month early, right? you know, comparatively. And we still had to do all the things, but um, it felt and there was a lot of emotional things going on out and around, even just, you know, that were outside of me. But because I had done all that good work and really maintained a nice sense of like, again, the prickliness, Mm -hmm. you know, like the, Mm -hmm. the security, the house, like whatever you want analogy you want to use. But I had, I had built a really strong foundation. So it's like you had a fort. I had a fort. Yeah, totally. I I (laughs) built a fort, you know, a mental, emotional, energetic fort. Yeah. And, um, the morning that I, so funny. Yeah. You know, it's coming, you know, it's coming. But from my first birth, I was so disembodied. I didn't know it was coming and I wanted it to come. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Yeah. This is normal. It's normal not to know what's going on. (laughs) I don't know what to do. But, um, this time, I mean, I I like, I drank my espresso and I sat out on my patio Mm. and I sat there with my journal and I was like looking at the astrology for the day (laughs) and, you know, rocking my hips and like doing cat cow And I remember just being like, you know, yep, like my heart knew like today was going to be the day. And like within a couple hours, I started having like period crampy kind of feelings. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had a bowel movement. Mm -hmm. That's like another positive sign. It's it's voiding. Voiding. You're comfy. You're cozy. You're you're you know, you're doing that. So then I had a shower. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the shower. And by that point, the cramps are getting more intense. 
but mentally and energetically, that's all they are. They're not anything more than, than cramps, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I'm in the shower and I have a couple of actual powerful surge like contractions that brought me to my knees mm -hmm. and they bring you to your knees because you just have to follow the impulse of yes. where your body is feeling the most comfortable without yeah. resistance. Yeah. So it's like a wave and then you kind of come down and then so, but in between I'm washing my hair, I'm <laughs> shaving my legs and I have a smile on my face ear to ear because I know what's happening. I know I'm going to meet my baby and I am just like overjoyed. Uh -huh. Well, I have two that bring me to my knees. And so I'm like, I better get out of the shower. <laughs> and I walk to the kitchen. That's where my phone is. My mother-in-law is there with my other daughter. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, she's been asking me all morning. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Because she knew my water had broke like mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks or whatever. And um, my husband's working on things. He's not even around the house. Again, part of like the mental game going into like for me, and I think this is true for other women, you kind of want to be in denial. Mm -hmm. You kind of want to be in denial that because when you release attachment to the expectation yeah. of what's coming, you can get into a more, um, you know, like, again, the pain. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's different for your body. But it's like, it's also a tool to guide you. Of course. And so just by being in the moment and being guided and not being like, you know, a plus B equals C equals D in this linear fashion, but like mm -hmm. just experiencing non-linear mm -hmm. uh, body mm -hmm. is gold. So I tell my my mother-in-law, I'm like, I think I'm in labor. And this is the first time she's ever heard me say anything say like that. And she's like, you know, she gets so excited. And then I have a contraction. And by this point, I'm not really, I'm not breathing through them. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. like, you know, kind of like my, my, they're taking like, your breath away. Yeah, they're taking my breath away. Yeah, as they probably should. Yeah, yeah. But this is like, I mean, we're talking about maybe number five. Mm -hmm. And so um, she's like, I'm going to call Michael. I'm like, okay. That's my husband's name. Mm -hmm. And then I call my midwife. And I'm immediately making my way back to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I'm in my shower towel. And I call her. And um, I have two contractions with her on the phone and they're like five minutes apart and mm -hmm. she talks me through it. They are taking my breath away. Mm -hmm. She coaches me through breathing and I'm um, just so beautiful. And I'm like, thank you so much. I needed that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you, you know, you pay for these services from these people that provide care for you, but like her coaching me through breathing was yeah. astounding. Yeah. And so she's like, so if we're settling into a rhythm, uh, give me a call back and um, let me know. Cool. I have one more. The baby's head comes out. The next one, she's on the floor. <laughs> and um, when Love I had it. gone to the bathroom, in hindsight, coming into the bathroom, I had taken the laundry hamper, which is about counter height, and put it between me and the door and okay. crouched behind it as I'm having the conversation with the midwife. Mm. So I call her and I tell her, hey, so um, Roma's here. And she's like, what? I had no idea. I was talking to you, you sounded so normal. I thought we had it hours. And ironically, she had uh, lent out her car or something. So she had to call somebody to get a ride to our house. So it was another 25 minutes before she was right. like there. there. And, you know, I've delivered a couple babies throughout my medical training. Mm -hmm. My uh, mother-in-law was actually a nurse and had mm. done um, labor and delivery before, too, mm -hmm. in her past life. So we just got her warm and held her and rubbed her. And, you know, by default, delayed cord clamping. Uh, within five minutes, the placenta came right out. Um, my husband showed up two minutes after she was born. And um, we have this picture of like the three, the four of us now, I guess I'm holding the newborn and my other daughter sitting on my husband's lap and they're sitting on the edge of the bathtub and like I'm sitting on the toilet and we're just like ecstatically, you know, looking at this little, this little newborn. Uh. So, I mean, I, yeah, I, I turned into a cat and I had a very physiologic birth and building my energetic fort and like the depth in which it, I was kind of called and pulled to like uncover and build. Yeah. Whoa. And um, I'm just so incredibly grateful. Thank you. 
for sharing this. Yeah, it's, it's, um, th like you said, you had a baby like a cat. And that is technically how mammals are supposed to have babies, from what I have learned. Um, yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, no, and what's so interesting is um, in, you know, I haven't had many clients who have birthed babies while I've been working with them. Um, but, you know, you hear stories and difficulty and, and you hear the difficulties that so many women have. I mean, it just happens. And there's always this part of my brain that goes, I don't think it has to be this difficult. And when you wrote and you, you gave me that full story in email, I'm like, this is it. And, and you took it upon yourself, Erica, to become a nerd and a geek to reestablish the connection with your somatic self through the yoga, um, the work that you were doing, the psycho, spiritual, emotional, the obviously smart body, smart mind, and the workshop. I mean, there, it wasn't just one thing. But at the end of the day, it was, it seems like being connected to your true nature and your animal nature, and then having to create all these interesting elements in a modern world, you know, it's just great that you were on the phone with the midwife, you're in the bathroom where there's this idea that you have to be in a tub of water or you have to be, you know, in this certain, it's like, eh. Is that necessary when you are connected with yourself in that way? Um, it's just a natural process that's been happening for thousands of tens of thousands of years mm -hmm. more than that. Mm -hmm. um, it yeah. reminds me of um, something that we talked about briefly before we hit record. Um, and I did a longer vlog on this where um, the book, uh, it's called Travels by Michael Crichton, and he um, is passed. He, he died quite young, actually, of a heart attack, um, which makes sense when you read the book and you read his trauma and his, his paradox of being a medical doctor and then leaving that system and feeling a spiritual world that in the 70s and 80s just wasn't ready for him yet. I think that's probably why he passed so early. But he tells a story, one of the chapters in this book, Travels, is called The Boston Lying In Hospital. And he was a resident, and this chapter is all about his pediatric residency where he is watching babies being born, and this hospital was just for birthing babies. But what was interesting, he said, was Boston in, it was probably the 60s-ish, uh, um, there were three wings, or three sections of this old building you can imagine, you know, brick, Boston, old school. And there was one wing where all the women were there with their makeup and their hair. They were the more affluent Boston folk. <laughs> and they were all drugged out. I don't know what the drugs would have been back then, but they were drugged out. Then there was another level, which I can't remember wh what or whom they were, but we could say they were more the middle class women who didn't have the affluence to pay for the expensive medicine. So they were alert, but I think a bit numbed out from some kind of medication. And then the back room were all the teenage girls who had gotten pregnant out of wedlock. And they didn't get nothing other than a bed and they were left alone. And so as Michael went into these different um, uh, rooms, wings, I guess, First of all, he said the whole hospital was like Dante's Inferno because you just heard these screams and all these things. But you, he went into the back room where these younger women were who weren't allowed any medical um, intervention. He said they were the ones that were connected to their babies, even though they were going to have them and they were going to be taken away. And they were talking to their babies and being with the pain. And he and they were, expl I'm getting shivers thinking about it right now, explaining to him, yeah, I just realized if I breathe this certain way, if I, like they were figuring it out naturally how to be with these intense, what are like period contractions, as you said. And he felt such connection with them 
because they were just so innocent and really had done nothing wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a beautiful chapter and hard, but um, he really did, he called it, I'm pretty sure, the medicalization of birth. And I mean, we could go into all the elements of, you know, tummy time and crying it out and all these crazy pediatric um, points of teaching mothers, you know, this is what you're supposed to do and da 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 da. I just wanted to share that for those listening um, to this. I did another video on that. We'll post it below here. What's your commentary on that little scenario I just painted? Well, f from, uh, again, everything I understand about medicine, I'm also really through all my own personal journeys, mm -hmm. um, growing into kind of grieving the fact that our world doesn't celebrate the goddess enough anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I came across this book and um, you're so good with names, by the way. I love how you remember every single like piece of work you've ever done and you know their name. I'm like attracted to the title and the sure. imagery. And then like, <laughs> I, I'm like, oh gosh. But anyway, <laughs> I, so it's this, um, so just thank you because you're, welcome. you're so good at that. But um, you can tell PhD scholar woman put together almost like an encyclopedia book reference book about all the goddess imagery and mm. one of the first ones that i was exposed to is the oldest goddess statue found in the world from an archaeologic standpoint and it's called the goddess of willendorf <laughs> google it mm -hmm. um it's this little tiny clay ceramic you know they're made it usually they were chiseled out of like stone like limestone and stuff but the smallest one's like two and a half centimeters big, so like an inch. And then there's big ones. Yeah. 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 So I've now been creating these little goddesses out mm -hmm. of clay. And I have one on my bedside table. But the imagery of it is as a faceless, round woman. Full body, full breast, full belly. Mm -hmm. And then her labia and her vulva is like an exquisite feature. Right. And, you know, so the paradox between goddess celebrated culture and <laughs> goddess repressed. I mean, women yeah. were being burned for having red tents. Mm -hmm. You know, women used to commune around crystals and mm -hmm. brew herbs, herbs, drink herbal tea. And because they weren't following, you know, priesthood or yes. obeying their men, they were burned. Like, that's what a witch... Anyway, I'm reading The Secret History of Witches. No, the, it's the, yeah, delightful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, turns out, I'm a witch. I'm a witch <laughs> in the fullest expression of what witches have ever been. And I, like, I just, I just see that medicine got so far away from honoring the goddess mm -hmm. and you know this little goddess of willendorf she doesn't have a face yeah because you know like it's the biology it's biology yeah. and she all she represents is uh creation you know i've seen and, this um yeah is it was that originally in malta Oh, so yes, but i mean it's been found all over like all we're over. talking thirty five thousand years ago right, right. You know, and it's it just it's so neat. It's like the oldest sort of spiritual mm -hmm. totem that they mm -hmm. found, you know, predates Egypt, predate I mean thirty five thousand years. That's like we're talking Neanderthal kind of crawling out of the cave sort yeah. of like um ancestry. Yeah. Um so yeah, I'm and you know, now I'm a mother to daughters and I'm just I'm just so tickled mm -hmm. about this life and what we're learning and what we get to contribute and what we get to share and what we get to inspire mm -hmm. because um I joke around but I'm like old white medicine is going away. It feels that way. It is. Um I'm all for a good orthopedic surgery if you need to b fix a bone. Oh, heck yeah. Heck right? yeah. And, like, and I, I like to make that really clear because I would be in a wheelchair or an amputee if it wasn't for a good old orthopedic surgery of, you know, a few patella fractures and all those things. But um, uh, uh, recently, I have to share this, uh, someone was interviewing me for their podcast and he said at the end, Irene, if 95% of the human 
race were all regulated and fully embodied, what do you see? He asked me that question and I just laughed because I said, wow, that would be pretty incredible. Um, and I said, 95%? <laughs> so there's still 5% to keep us honest, right? And he's like, yeah. Um, and I, I said, you know, I think we wouldn't have all the hospitals that we have because we wouldn't need them because people would know not only how to take care of themselves, but we would be um, raising and being with not just the pregnant mothers and them before nurturing them, but babies. And it seems like to me, and I'd love to get your hit on this, Erica, if we could just agree on how to raise babies from conception to age five, holy shit, we would have a completely different world in about 20 years. Absolutely. And it seems like nobody, and I'm almost just putting my stake in the ground here, we just have to say, this is how it's supposed to be. It's the way with mammals. Mm -hmm. You would never ask a mama bear to have her cubs not be with her when they're sleeping. You would never not teach the cub how to fend and fight and, and feed and all these things. And yet we're, we have these all these different books on this is this kind of parenting and that kind of parenting. And it's just a chaotic mess. So like, should we just put the stake in the ground and say, this is, does that make sense? Am I making sense with that? Yeah. And again, I don't, I don't remember again in the moment what language I use, but it's this like, it's the physiologic way. Or, it's like yes. when you, when you're so intuitive, I mean, I love the work you do because you're like, what does your impulse say? Mm -hmm. If you have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. Nobody's yeah. holding you here. You yeah. know, Yeah. if you want to yawn, yawn, if yawn. you have to fart, fart, like, Please. you know, yeah. and yet we've created these like P's and Q's and there is a level of integrity mm -hmm. that is natural to us mm -hmm. when we allow our bodies to follow our impulse. And, yeah. you know, I say that, but you know, that 5%, that 5% can be so jarring mm -hmm. that it's like we have to offer points of correction. And I know you've talked about this before, just in child rearing, et cetera, that, you know, oftentimes we can be, we can almost become the exact opposite of the type of parenting that we thought was wrong for us yeah. instead of like the pendulum being somewhere in the middle. Yes. And so I kind of like look at the world and, you know, I know I made that, you know, jokingly comment about, you know, old man medicine, but mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like now that we're learning and we have this technology, you know, and, you know, hopefully, you know, who was threatened by that? Mm hmm you know, um, and then hopefully their consciousness is evolved by now. I know? hope so. I hope so. I, um, there's a, there's a feeling like it just might be that that world just has to slowly wilt and wither until the, the leaves are dead in the ground and it's just been recycled out. Um, yeah. The cause dean of you my know, meds. Oh, go ahead. No, I just, you know, you're, you're younger than me and you know, we're in the same kind of bubble of seeing this. And I do feel that there are those in their thirties, forties who are at still the beginning of their careers who want to create this new way of, of not just seeing childbirth differently and, and rearing kids and motherhood, but healing and health. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but when our nervous system is really in tune and we're in tune with it, it takes a bit of work to reprogram our ways around that because we've been so conditioned to not listen to those things. But I mean, it's only been a few years since you came across this work. That's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of a person's history. And the difference is, Erica, you, you embraced it. My sense is there was never a moment where you were like, screw this. I'm not going to learn this anymore. Like you, right. You're, you're fully in. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm a weirdo. I love my shadow. Mm -hmm. And again, nobody's getting out of here alive. As soon as we start seeing our shadow for what it really is and start loving your shadow, not being afraid to do the work. Um, I would say, you know, everybody can have that physiologic birth or yeah. whatever the experience is. Um, 
Yeah. Let it be so. <laughs> no, we were saying about uh, the like the leaf analogy. Yeah. But my dean in medical school, mm. she was just like, ladies, change happens one death at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I loved it. I was like, ooh, that's dark, but that's, you're right. It does, you know? Wow. And then um, John Mackey, who, um, you know, founded Whole Foods, he wrote a book mm. called Conscious Capitalism. Mm. And because um, capitalism is another layer to medicine and to yep. why it's what it is. And, you know, I'm like, also at this like new awareness where it's like okay what is money how does money feel Mm -hmm. what is like necessary about money what is abundance Mm -hmm. and then um because capitalism is just it's just a it's just a really um it's everywhere and if we're not careful our ego gets in the way because we feel less than and we want more Mm -hmm. so if we can feel whole and, you know, we feel more equal and like, you know, we, we see the equalness in, in all creatures, you know, I, I, it's just, again, getting back to kind of like that animal kind of way of being, mm-hmm. you know, in the animal world, it's seasonally dependent, yes. you know, your resources are more local and, you know, this is how natives have lived, you know, and so it's like, I think we're at the point where we can appreciate some of the benefits of, of capitalism of but like you know like the paradox is like okay but like how much is enough and then like how can we consciously co-create and create and then also like oh, all the things yeah and use use that capital for things that are um that will give not just give back but help develop your own capacity to do more of what a person wants to do that is in the service of whether it's your own family because not everybody has to be a healer to serve the world right your own family your community whether you're a carpenter or someone who teaches school or you are a doctor or you do the work I do it's um, I think that th- there's a way to have that like he said conscious capitalism um, because we've also seen you know I don't want to make this a, a an ending about that level but socialism doesn't have its attributes either no it's like there's always someone at the top dictating what happens even in that system so i think i do feel that there is a shifting of the guards um and it's going to be exciting although a bit rocky i think as these systems shift into new systems I want to mention one thing, too, that I think you will enjoy. I learned this in my somatic experiencing training. Of course, I don't have peer-reviewed backup to, you know, claim this, but it was one of our um, instructors, Stephen Hoskinson, who um, used to be on the SE faculty, and he said one day in one of our uh, classes that the medicalization of birth and when that really started, and I don't know the exact date, but, you know, somewhere in those early 1900s, is why the explosion of psychedelics happened in the 60s. Because those babies who are now older, adult, didn't get that euphoric attachment connection that an infant should get when they come into this world. That yummy, mummy, skin on skin, gazing, you are the center of my universe and that is how it should be. Therefore, there's this searching and this grabbing for that psychedelic experience that does give you that DMT trip, right? That is like, wow, universe and stars and colors. And um, as more psychedelic research and all the plant medicines are just popping, I just can't help but wonder, you know, to go back to my friend's question, if 95% of us are all regulated and we're birthing our babies, that a lot of what's hot right now and hyped up will just, again, like the leaves, slowly, Mm -hmm. and it will Mm -hmm. be reserved for actual cases that have been traumatic, like real traumatic things that might need a little bit of a burst of energy to get the healing going. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, or even just, you know, the traditional ceremonial purposes, which is to um, create that motherly connection Mm -hmm. to the planet. And the earth, yes. Yeah. 
you know, I, 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 I'm right there with you. I see, you know, this kind of bandwagonism, you know, we got doctor down the street doing ketamine clinics to reverse depression and like, you know, um, (laughs) you're right. I mean, it's just, it's just sad. It's sad that so many of us, um, haven't, haven't developed the capacity for Mm self-healing because, um, when we just rely on these external processes to then bring us close to it, I, I think it promotes addiction. Of course. You know, and it's, it's, it's addiction promoting. And so, you know, you're, you have to keep falling back on, mm-hmm. you know, those experiences mm-hmm. to then feel the connection. Yes. I mean, sure, it's more powerful than taking an antidepressant, you know, it, 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 the effect might last a little longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, again, a, a paradox. It is a paradox. I, I think we're, we understand each other there. Cause yeah, I, I would say yes, the, the chemicals are different when it's a natural plant. And, um, I just did an interview with a young man about an ayahuasca ceremony that did not go well. And I'm glad he's still alive cause he almost didn't make it. Wow. Um, and you know, the, the, um, I guess you could say the the few comments that were not as positive to that interview would say, well, it sounds like he found the dark, the shadow, um, and that's what that's supposed to be for. And I, I, I say, of course, but if it brings you to ending your life and being absolutely paranoid and not able to, to live, then that's taken a little too far. Um, Um, and so, yes, there might be death, the feeling of death and pain, but has your system become more dysregulated as a result of that process? Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of my argument, if you will, would be, we just don't know how much has stored up in our system as a result of our histories and our traumas. Um, and I think Erica, your, your share of the hip flexor tightness knowing something was off, the tracking of it, the work that you did, that that was just such a titrated, lovely way of uncovering that. And then the end result was new human life that was not influenced by anything but yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think childbirth has been held akin to some of those really intense psychedelic journeys. And... um, I mean, I'm just so tickled. I got to be a woman this life <laughs> to mm-hmm. experience it, you know, um, the, I mean, oh, you were saying so many things that I wanted to keep, keep kind of going down, but the Western medicine juxtaposed with indigenous ways, mm-hmm. speaking back to the ceremony and the ayahuasca thing. Mm-hmm. I think if we're running from our Western capitalistic, you know, skin colored, skin colored agenda that has been happening for hundreds of years, going straight into ayahuasca and expecting it to get better, you're going to see some darkness Mm -hmm. because you have to shed some serious generational Mm -hmm. like it's almost like an arbitration like Mm -hmm. you know and so um that slow titration that that you just mentioned it's Mm -hmm. like if the whole world was 95 percent (laughs) regulated great do the sacred ceremonies let's live in harmony with gaia but when we're not regulated and that five percent you know, I mean, what I'm really curious about is if you pull back all the layers and humans are just human on the planet mm-hmm. and we are living in harmony mm-hmm. with the planet, mm-hmm. is there schizophrenia? Is there depression? Is there anxiety? You know, when we're talking about the humans being nurtured the way animals nurture, you know, there's still light and dark. Yeah. There's, still there's still a death. predator that yeah. comes in. There's still it's death. Still Nobody's death. getting out of here alive. Exactly. Nobody. My hunch, my dear, is if, 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 if we had that, I don't think there would be those things that you just mentioned. 
I think there might be the off genetic Mm -hmm. defect that Mm -hmm. might occur. Um, But I often say, you know, my crazy example, and this is so off there and out in the universe, but like, how do we not know that X defect that a baby is born with isn't due to this weird anomaly at week 12 in the pregnancy where mom ate a certain type of chemical dye and ketchup while she was angry. Like you just, you see how ludicrous that is, but it's like, it's that could explain that one in 10 million defect that these two women had this thing happen and it just created this perfect chemical genetic um, snipping that made it such that this, and then of course you have things like thalidomide and that where it's like a legitimate chemical that has just done something to, yeah. right? Which is a completely different thing. So um, the microbiome is where I get really excited because it's mm-hmm. like energy concepts become more Western and more concrete. Right. And, um, you know, so we have trillions of bacteria all in our gut. Mm-hmm. Humans have the most unique diversity of all animal um biomes because we eat so many different things we travel right and then now we have all these artificial environments and artificial chemicals um there's been research to suggest that we have bacteria that can actually metabolize bpa now oh so our gut bacteria are hyper evolving they go can you define BPA in case BPA bisphenol A and it's um, an ingredient in most plastics. So there was the speaking of babies, mm-hmm. there was this whole movement in the late '90s, early 2000s to go BPA free. Yes. And um, reason being, when plastic baby bottles were really popular and we were, you know, microwaving them and whatever else to heat up our formula, um, it was realized, and we can thank the state of California for caring so much about these chemicals because um, they have a very hyper-regulated kind of EPA, and they're the, they're largely the the state that then developed the regulation to pull yeah. BPAs out of plastics that then we heat up, although yeah. it's not perfect, so Tupperware, et cetera, and now there's bpbs and bpcs and it just keeps going down the list right so bad things yeah bad bad things bad things you know and it's all chemistry but Mm -hmm. um and it all comes from the same source but Mm -hmm. when we manipulate it and then we eat it and we eat it without a regulated nervous system there's absolutely consequences so when it comes to like digestion and gut health your nervous system regulation is all you need to know because you can then tolerate eating i mean you can even eat mcdonald's if you want if you have a regulated nervous system and you won't get sick but as soon as you have a dysregulated nervous system you can bet all hell will break loose Mm -hmm. and the um, literature for this came from trauma surgery within hours of a car accident depending on the injury severity score so like say somebody broke a bunch of ribs say somebody broke a femur um you know you name it maybe there's acute blood loss Um, the sicker a person is, is directly correlated with the time to when bacteria, E. coli, get into the bloodstream. Mm. Why? 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 Well, that stress hormone fight flight reaction, which you talk about so well, there's homeostatic, get me out of bed, tell somebody to, you know, F off or something. I'm being prickly. Leave me alone. Whatever. That's all normal. Um, or there's also like fight or flight. Like, I think I'm going to die. I need to defend myself or I think I'm going to die. Maybe I'm going to freeze. So all of this like fight, flight or, um, dorsal vagal response, Mm -hmm. um, releases corticotropin releasing hormone from the brain, which also goes down to the gut level and breaks open all the tight junctions at the gut. So whatever you have just eaten and digested that isn't formally broken down into its tiniest of particles to be absorbed and used by the body's biochemistry, you get leaky gut by a stress response. These chemicals go across the uh, gut brain barrier, your immune system, your autoimmune system starts, you know, recognizing everything as foreign. This is how we see celiac. Mm -hmm. This is how we see dairy. This is how we see all of these things and it's because your nervous system dysregulated you to a point of actually having 
leaky gut Area. and then you have yeah. yeah and so it's just this like oh it's just it's just so mind-boggling to me so that notion of like the anger emotion or whatever it was mm-hmm. again depending on the person that has a different chemical property in the body mm-hmm. some people get triggered we, we say trigger, um, what was another activation? Activated. I like activation. Yeah. You know, we get activated based off of our memories, our limbic memories. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why the early childhood stuff is so important because all the stuff we don't remember before five yep. gets imprinted so strongly. And then um, are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy? I know the names. I couldn't quote anything. But okay, yes. so I am a Waldorf parent. Yes. Um, Anthroposoph. So Rudolf Steiner is um, one of my heroes. Mm-hmm. Physician, um, agriculturist. He mm-hmm. um, is also like part of the creation of biodynamic agriculture. Yes, that's why I know. Thank yeah. you. So it's like pre permaculture, mm-hmm. very witchy, mm-hmm. lots of herbal things, lots of, you know, as like um, soil amendments, fertilizers. You know, it, again, this is pre chemical era. Yeah. What do you have around you um, to build this ecosystem? Anyway, very thoughtful, very, very, very thoughtful. And um, his approach to childhood education, extremely thoughtful. It's all about neuroregulation without even using the scientific language of what neuroregulation is. Exactly. Um, they talk about rhythm and living in rhythm and honoring that in children, um, celebrating children for their uniqueness and their developmental stage. And then, you know, they really call it soul development. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's just so beautiful. So Steiner... Um, used to lecture to medical students in the early 1900s all over Europe. And you can find his lectures. Uh, there's, there's a gentleman on a podcast, I think it's just Rudolf Steiner, um, like lectures, but he reads them. <laughs> and I'm such a nerd, I listen to them. I listen to them while I'm driving. And uh, of course, this is translated. I think he was, um, yeah, German. German, yeah. Um, and, you know, his whole point of creating Waldorf was, you know, post-World War era, we don't want to raise lemmings to then go become Nazis. We want to raise individuals, human soul development, so that we can have a better world. Mm -hmm. And you now it's a worldwide education practice. It's Mm -hmm. a worldwide agricultural practice. Mm -hmm. Um, He was really ahead of his time. But he has a lecture series where he's talking about um, see children with allergies. Mm. And I don't remember the name of the respiratory illness that they had in the early 1900s, but he comments that the child who has this respiratory illness and then has a cat in the crib with him right. is the child that then develops the allergy to cats because the limbic system is appreciating all of the sensory chemical interactions between organism and environment. Yes. And just like that, um, you know, nervous system response to whatever you ate, we, we do that from a respiratory standpoint as well. Mm-hmm. Now, did he have the biochemical science to look at this? No, we now barely do to look at it in gut models, but he observed this happening. So like you said, you know, I don't have evidence to back this up. It's okay. What are you observing? Exactly. I mean, that's like all bringing it back to like, your work and you know orienting and just observation like what is true for you right now mm-hmm. so i'm i'm there with you told you no, I'm that's a great surgeon and witch <laughs> i'm all about i'm the white witch is strong in this household as well <laughs> um i absolutely adored the uh again i didn't read the book but the outlander series where um you know she was a doctor and went back and she was a witch and they tried to get her because she was doing things that were healing people. And, and it's just, it's so fascinating. If I had a whole other lifetime, Erica, I would, I would study the history of medicine and all the ways that it, it came to where it is now so that we can see, okay, how can we create the new medicine model that is based on all the things that are accurate and good blending them together, which you are doing. So it's very cool. Very cool. Um, anything 
else you would like to share with everyone listening to this as a mother, as a doctor, as a white witch, mm. all of the above? Like a sign off? I don't know. Again. Sign off or anything that you <laughs> would, anything that was on your mind that you, you maybe haven't mentioned or talked about um, thus far. I, I don't know. I mean, that was just such a lovely flow. I mm-hmm. mean, I never thought we would get to go as deep as we did. I love, love, love the gut microbiome. Um, but I think I got a good opportunity to share my kind of golden nuggets. Yeah. The nervous system and your ability to find regulation, you know, like just recently I went back to work. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was like, uh, just noticing my breath and how easy I can breathe in my own body was Mm -hmm. like my favorite thing about being off on maternity leave. Yeah. And I made a little promise to myself that I was going to maintain the equanimity back at work. And I immediately was pulled out of it. Yeah. And so, um, something like what we just talked about, which is, um, applying all of these things in the up down workshop we called it the life shop that's right there was there was a lot of (laughs) you know experiencing Mm -hmm. what we do in the workshop setting and then pulling it out Mm -hmm. using it staying aware and Mm -hmm. then bringing it back Mm -hmm. you know like like you said um I, i would love to live in a retreat setting i mean that's what monks do right of course so monks sit and meditate and they do all this stuff and they have all this like wise stuff to say and it's like it's great and then it's like you know you pull yourself out of a retreat and you're just like what the fuck just happened yeah (laughs) but it's like it's because this is the life shop you know and so you know one of the things i'm kind of growing into is just more life shop work Mm -hmm. um so yeah i guess that's the last thing I wanted to say. That's beautiful. Thank you for reminding me <laughs> that. I haven't thought of that in a while. That was one of the um, participants. I think it was Rich. Um, he, he's like, oh, I'm doing the life shop. I'm going to bring this stuff into my into my life. And it's true because I think that um, we tend to not do enough integration time with people when they are in these retreats because it's so hard with finances and people have to go back to work and kids and They can't take five days to integrate slowly back into their day to day. Um, So it's not easy. And so when you said that you got pulled right out of that, I'm not surprised. And it's because we're just, that's how it is. Um, But I sense you'll get it back. That's my sense. I already did. I did. I did take a little mini, mini uh, weekend retreat for myself uh, with some girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And that's when we did your drop in class. That was Ah, good. Yes. Um, but yeah, just, you know, being patient with my mm-hmm. own body and mm-hmm. with what's going on. And, you know, that's where I do rely heavily on, you know, um, like Ayurvedic and even like Chinese medicine dietary principles. Yeah. Cold winter months yeah. is not the time to be feeling so busy and out of body that you're only eating cold food or skipping meals, which is yeah. exactly what happens to surgeons when you know spontaneous random cases are being added or you're being woken up several times in the middle of the night on top of having a newborn or you know five people in your office are coming to you complaining about one thing or the other yeah so um yeah just (laughs) i'm very humble there's a lot of good good lessons all the time all around me Mm -hmm. thank you my sense is because you are a full-time doctor and you you do that as your world are you doing anything um, offering online with anything, or are you just pretty much doctor and mama? Um, right now, largely doctor and mama, yep. um, because my heart does feel so. I don't want to say anti Western medicine, mm-hmm. but again, there's there's not a lot of room for me to do all the things that I love to do within my clinical job. Yeah. You know, even just documenting things. I'm like, you know, we document for insurance purposes. And so your insurance doesn't care that we talked about nervous system regulation or Mm-mm. gut microbiome stuff. Mm-mm. So me and um, my business partner, mm-hmm. we have launched a um, kind of gut nervous system 
based programming and again it's not nearly to the level that you do but placeholders Mm -hmm. and um, awareness and conversations and safe space for people who have had bariatric surgery Mm -hmm. which just is not being done great Um, and it's an online um, there's you know two courses and then um, different kind of levels of engagement but yeah it's called art of bariatrics because we are practicing the art of the life shop Mm -hmm. and um, yeah so I I do that and then um, a couple years ago, pre-2019, when I first met you, um, I had been asked to give a uh, nutrition and chronic pain lecture for a local pain summit. Mm-hmm. And I was excited to go down the rabbit hole of nervous system regulation, all these things from a gut perspective Mm -hmm. and from a GI function, because when we are pulled out of a rest and digest capacity state, we do not digest anything well. Mm -hmm. This is what IBS is. Mm -hmm. And um, I was trying to really link that to chronic pain for, for people without even knowing your work, without even knowing Stephen Porges. I was like, I need to know more about the vagus nerve because the gut brain axis is like, it's just right here. And 2016 was a huge explosion of all that research. And that's when I went to podcasts because I was commuting and I found you interviewing a bunch of people. And then I just started following you, watching all your YouTube stuff, found Stephen Porges, read his book, found Peter Levine, read his books. And then I put for, I basically produced a banging, 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 um, uh, lecture series for that whole conference and then the next year came back and did a four-hour workshop and people were like we want more have a podcast um write a book like come on (laughs) we want more and I'm just like there's just not no time (laughs) there's no time so when the pandemic happened I just recorded it Mm -hmm. and I put it on a website that Mm -hmm. I cheekily called uh lavella your guts um that way it's like a little bit of a um yeah anyway so that's out there yeah. that's out there great so we'll i can link that then it's somewhere cool perfect yeah, yeah. level up your guts Le- love Le- it. level it's, them up it's level so them up. Good. <laughs> um well i have no doubt that we will continue our conversations whether online or in the private white witch space yeah. um and i think it would be great to talk to you actually about the vegas connections that you have uncovered um, in another chat. So I think I'm going to put a pin in that one and just say, we'll have to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I I have a lot to say about a journey with that. So good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad we met. I am thankful for this internet world and that connection and, and our ability to stay connected without living in the same area. And, um, let's keep the conversations going, Erica. Absolutely. I'm a fangirl. I'll I'll be following. I will be following you too. Thank you so much. (laughs) Have a wonderful day. Hey, it's Irene. Quick note before you go. I want to make sure you know about my upcoming enrollment to my 12-week online curriculum called Smart Body, Smart Mind. I will say that one more time. Smart Body, Smart Mind. This is my online nervous system rewire and regulation program that my team and I have been running for many years. This will be the 13th time we have run this powerful online curriculum with people all around the world. So I wanna make sure you know about the upcoming registration that will be mid-February for a short period of time and we will start the live session end of February, 2023. It's a three month curriculum and it is life changing. So if you would like to do the work with me, and this is exactly where we do the work, deeper theory, practices, teaching with me live, Q&A sessions with my expert colleagues, this is what you wanna do. I want you to learn about it now so you have plenty of time to ask questions and make a non-survival-based decision on joining this year. Somewhere near this video will be a link to that information page. Be sure to check that out and ask questions. If you have any questions, you can post one below this video or send us an email support at irenelyon.com.